Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. So thank you so much for coming. Um, I'm going to give a presentation, but I'm going to start with a story. I usually start with a story, and the story starts with a question. Is it a chile? Oh, that's a good quick start. Since I don't speak Dutch, could you just pronounce your name for us? I'm going to introduce myself a little bit more elaborately later, but it's Tael. Yeah. Cool. Um, so I usually start with a story, and the story starts with a question. Is it a cheetah? And you might have read the article by um, Stephanie Tolan. Um, if you see a cheetah sitting somewhere, it's actually quite easy to recognize them. Why? Because it's the only animal that can go over 100 kilometers an hour. So it goes more than 100 kilometers an hour, it's a cheetah. Easy to identify. But the question then comes, what if we have that cheetah in a zoo, in a little you know, 10 by 10 space? Do I see it run 100 kilometers an hour? No. So is it still a cheetah? Hmm. Well, we don't do that to cheetahs anymore, right? We put them into like a big safari park, so he's got lots of space. So there he is, sitting underneath the tree, not moving at all. Because one of the qualities of a cheetah is that they can sit motionless for three hours <laughs> and actually be awake. So is it still a cheetah? But it's, he just doesn't have a reason to move. That's a problem. So the next day, the truck comes by, brum, 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 and throws, you know, a hunk of meat over the edge. And the cheetah's like, oh, wow, food. So he chugs his way there, picks it up, chugs his way back to his tree, and there he sits. He didn't go faster than like three miles an hour. So is it a cheetah? Wait, a cheetah is a hunter. He needs something to be able to hunt. So the next day, the truck comes by again, brum, brum, but not a hunk of meat, but a rabbit. So the rabbit goes over the edge, and the cheetah is like, ooh, I'm made for this. I'm a predator. That's mine. So he gets ready. He runs and he goes 100 kilometers an hour. He really does. But when he does that, he misses the rabbit because it just goes like five kilometers an hour. So he misses it. He trips, hits a tree, and he goes back. He's like, oh, wow, well, that wasn't a good idea. So he picks up the rabbit, goes sit on his tree, and eats a rabbit. And that's how it goes three years in a row. Every day he gets his rabbit. And after a while, our cheetah knows how to perfect his technique to go the slowest possible pace to get the rabbit. Because <laughs> the rabbit goes like five miles an hour, so he goes five and a half, but not like a single inch more. But is it still a cheetah? It's a lazy cheetah. He's just too lazy to run. Well, he doesn't really have a reason, does he? So one day there's this beautiful moment, because there, off in the distance, is the gazelle. The gazelle, the evolutionary reason that the cheetah is able to run 100 kilometers an hour because, you know, gazelles go 95 kilometers an hour. So if you can't go that fast, you're really, really hungry. So our cheetah sees that gazelle and he's like, wow, I'm made for this. So he gets ready. He wants to go. But, you know, he trips. He sprains his ankle because, yeah, he didn't run for two years. So did you think he's going to go 100 kilometers an hour in one go? Probably not. So his head lowers a bit, goes back to his tree. And he's like, wow. Well, that's not a good idea. Picks up his rabbit because, you, you know, you got to eat something. <laughs> and then he sits there. And every time, off in the distance, he sees the gazelle. He's like, I made for this, but nah, I'll never make that. And he picks up his rabbit and goes sits under a tree. Is it still a, uh, a cheetah? And, well, another question we might ask is, um, might there be a metaphor in this story? <laughs> Tough question, of course, at the end of the day. <laughs> um, <laughs> But yeah, so this compares a lot with gifted kids, right? You know, if you just keep feeding them rabbits and then at some point you just give them a gazelle, there's a big chance that they won't be able to get it. Like, so do they have everything they need? So, of course, the introduction, who am I? And how do I actually pronounce my name? My name is Tel Koenderink. Uh, I'm from the Netherlands. I uh, live near Amsterdam for the people who've been in that uh, region. And I've been involved in education for most of my life now. And it started out by failing badly. I went through three different high schools, failing my final math exam uh, while working on the side as a pro uh, software programmer um, and a software architect. Uh, so that's kind of like a weird combination. And that kind of instilled the question in me, like, how, how does learning work? And how does the brain work? Because I've been proven I was hyper highly gifted with a special knack for analytical abilities, hence the computer programming. But I was failing my math exam. So I was like, how is it possible to have proven talent, but such lousy results? Like, how, how does that come about? Like, what's the difference in that? I um, traveled around the world, in the US, among other places, um, asking that question, going into fields like accelerated learning, speed memory techniques, speed learning, reading, um, creative problem solving, to figure out, like, how does the brain work? 
and how can you make the brain work? And that really led me on a course. Um, I had an IT company for a while, but in the end I went back to education. I did a lot of different things. I set up uh, an educational consulting company that's guiding about 500 schools in the Netherlands in you know, how to teach gifted students from acceleration programs, pull-out programs, full-time gifted programs. Um, I set up Feop Niveau is like the, the high school version of that, so we do it from primary up to high school. Uh, Phoenix is a gifted dropout recovery center. So kids who dropped out of school and often are depressed, have a burnout, a bore out, are really, really stuck. Often are twice exceptional students as well. We really try to give them an alternative future because usually like the regular education path isn't for them anymore. Uh, but finding a way to have them have a meaningful future. And most recently, I've started a couple of other things. Um, one of them is the reason I'm here, Take on Talents. Um, I've written three books, and my fourth book is going to be published in English. Um, so I'm doing a tour around the US, incidentally also traveling with my family for six months, um, which is not a big punishment, actually. Um, <clears throat> so, um, and this is part of it, to speak to different groups and to get to know a lot of people, to also you know, inform my final stages of the book that I'm writing. I'll say a little bit more about that later. Um, two years ago, out of all the things that I've learned, I was like, well, it's, it's uh, sometimes frustrating to be in the role of the consultant all the time because a school will hire you as long as things are going wrong. And when they're not so much wrong anymore, usually your advice isn't taken as seriously anymore. Well, I was like really ambitious, like let's change the education system. So I found some other idiots like me and we set up a new school. Uh, the School of Understanding, we started about two and a half years ago. Um, we've got about 200 students now, not specifically aimed at gifted, but a different innovative type of school. And I'll talk a little bit more about it in the end. And doing all this work, we found that the regular software programs aren't adequate in how to track students if you really want to track their development. So I started a software company, GrowWise, to support that development. So I'm really trying to go at it from all angles to figure out like how to improve the education system. Because I really think like that uh, one of the ways I often summarize it is if you look at the general public education system is that it's the right answer but to the wrong question. It's the right answer to how to prepare somebody for the future if it's the 1970s. It's just not the 1970s anymore. So that's kind of a challenge. So a lot of curriculum is still aimed at that kind of worldview. So how, how do we update that? And well, given the system, the public education system in most countries in the world isn't very likely to update itself. So I figured I'd play a role in that. So um, what we're gonna do tonight, um, I'm gonna give you an overview of a couple of things surrounding that I've learned about giftedness and it's surrounding the theme of the seven challenges of gifted students. Um, after working with hundreds of schools, I saw a couple of themes coming back again and again of challenges that students run into and practical solutions to that. Um, of course, I've got like an hour or something to, with you guys um, and you already noticed that I talk about at double speed just to make up for that, but there's a limit to that as well. So um, do cherry pick. It might be some things you don't agree with, some things you do, as long as you go home with two or three things where you're like, hey, that's practical, I can try that out with my own kid, then I hope you have had a good night. Um, you see the two cameras here. I usually record most of my sessions. I've got a lot of material in Dutch, but not in English as much. So that's why I'm recording these. It's for recording me, not for you. So I agreed that I'll cut out all the questions and all any personal details and stuff like that. So it's not about you guys. And I'll send some other materials as well. Some other presentations I've given. I see a lot of you guys, and that's very good and diligent, sitting with writing blocks. I will send the presentation after. I'll see with Kalina and Scooby how to, um, how to spread it to you guys, but I'll make sure you get it. Uh, so anything that's on the screen, you'll be able uh, to get if you want. And I hope for that at the end, I'll have some time for questions and answers if you, uh, if you want to. But given the short amount of time, let's keep the interruptions along the way to a minimum, because otherwise probably I won't get through the first challenge altogether. Um, so that's always a challenge. Um, so this is a part of the presentation where I start, you know, talking about all the deep theories of giftedness and, you know, what is really, what is giftedness. And this has been kind of like the big disappointments, disappointments for me in the past, like 15 years working in the field of gifted and reading like a gazillion books is like the more I learn about it, the vaguer the concept becomes. And the less theory there is to actually support what it is, how to measure it and how to objectify it. Um, so it's a challenge because this is the simplest model. Probably all of you have seen it. Like it's this Joe Renzulli's model. You know, you need three things, above average ability, creativity, and task commitment. And very diplomatically, Joe Renzulli said, this leads to gifted behavior, not a gifted individual. 
uh, which also leads to a lot of discussions. Um, but it's a bit of a challenge in that. And I took a, a Dutch cartoon for that, um, Fok and Sukke, they're like a very famous cartoon in the Netherlands. And they got the report card for the kid. Uh, failing all subjects, bad attitude, disruptive behavior. Uh oh, you don't think he's gifted, do you? <laughs> and some of you might recognize it, especially if you had, had, have had struggles with other schools before you came here, because I'm, I'm really impressed with, with the level that you're getting here, like the get level of education. But probably that's not completely on par with what you had before you came here. Um, so, you know, was your kid still showing above average ability? And was he showing it in a school setting or was he showing it in all settings? A lot of kids I see don't do it after a while. They're like the cheetahs. After a while of getting rabbits, they don't even try to get the gazelle anymore. It's just a pain if that's a standardized testing moment that they're going to determine if they're up for advanced placement or acceleration or stuff like that. Um, creativity, well, like the negative kind they often show, but <laughs> not always the positive, <laughs> constructive kind. And task commitment. Um, yeah, well, task commitment when they're interested in a subject, but that might not be spelling or that might not be like rote memorization. Uh, so even this simplest model, like it only gets more complex from this. Like you've got Gagné and Heller's model, you've got like 36 interrelated, you know, parts that might lead to gifted behavior in some or more fields. Like it just gets more and more complicated. And that's because you, in my way of looking at it, you kind of have two forms of diagnosis. You've got classifying diagnosis and you've got operational diagnosis. And classifying the diagnosis has as its presumption that if I know what you are, then I will know what to do with you. So if I know what you are, then I know what the characteristics of your class are, and then I know what to do with it. So say I've got two kids with ADD in my classroom, then I've got a test and I can say you have ADD. And because you have ADD, I can do ADD stuff with you. And that presumably will work. But the challenge is you might have two kids next to each other, one just barely not making the ADD grade according to the official classification, but showing all the behavior and needing all the support. And the other kid just going over the edge of being classified as such, but all the normal approaches don't work. So I tend to be more operational, just directly asking the question, what do you need? Because if we know what you need, we can start giving it to you as opposed to having that middle step of determining the specific type of giftedness and the amount of points that your gap between your IQ scores is, and because then I'll know what to do with you. There's many gifted kids as there are kids in general, but even gifted kids are further apart than like the general population is. So maybe we should take a more direct approach in asking, what do you need? And have a classification of that, and then having answers to meeting those needs. And if we have that, then we can start working with all kinds of kids without worrying too much about, you know, what are you? And the label is optional, as far as I'm concerned. I don't think that being gifted or being labeled gifted is by definition functional. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. It's functional to get into a place like this. And there's a reason that they have like a selection process because they need to meet the need of keeping the challenge level high. They meet, need to make sure that all the students have that same high level. So you need something to do that. But is it functional to know whether your IQ is, you know, 147 or 151? Is that going to change your life? Or knowing you're gifted, is that going to change your life? It's a question. And so both the systems have very different goals. Uh, the classification system actually was designed for research purposes, not for treatment purposes or insurance purposes. That's what it's mainly used for now. Um, so we might go back to the operational route. And then the question comes, what are those support needs? What help does a gifted kid need? And working with <coughs> what they call the Leonardo schools in the Netherlands, so those were the full-time gifted programs. I was a board member of the foundation that set them up, and we set about 25 different gifted full-time programs. And in teaching the teachers, we came to a conclusion that there's like a, a number of levels. And the first thing that everybody starts about with gifted children is content and knowledge. What they need is more challenge. And that's often because that's what's been lacking. But sometimes this gets overgeneralized to the point that content is the only thing they need. The only thing that could ever be wrong with a gifted kid is that he's not challenged enough. And that I'm not sure if that's true. Because what we saw in those full-time gifted programs is that they would create this really cool program, you know, with Chinese and philosophy and, and advanced science and all these different subjects. And a part of the students would do really, really well. They would come in, they're like, yeah, you know, so much stuff to learn that they'll really turn on. 
but a, a number of kids would get stuck. So for instance, um, they would get Spanish. And for, for us, that's a kind of an outlandish language. For you, it's a little bit more normal. Um, but they would get Spanish or, or Chinese, like, which is even more complicated to learn for some students. Um, and they, they would get their first vocabulary list. And one of the students started crying. And he's like, looking at the list, and he started crying. And the teacher would come over to him and he said, like, why are you crying? And the kid says, well, um, I don't understand these questions and these words. And that gives you a little bit of a peek inside his brain. I don't understand these words. He thought that a vocabulary list was kind of like a complicated IQ test. If you think long enough about the Spanish word, it will magically transform into an English or a Dutch word. No, you know, vocabulary lists are for random rote memorization. But he'd never done that. Like, seriously, never in his life. A 10-year-old had never memorized anything because everything he needed to know in school, he already knew three years before they would teach him. So he never had something in front of him that he would have to memorize. So he was missing something. He was missing the skill of memorization. And because he didn't have the skill of memorization, he wasn't able to deal with the content that was appropriate for his level. But it's not just the skill of memorization. It's also organization, planning, um, separating like, big things from small things, um, reading, organizing. Like, those are all kinds of skills. Some students have them, some don't. But if you don't have them, you can't function at the level that you would want to. But then you would have some students, because I was the, um, the learning skills, studying skills teacher. So I would teach you know, memorization skills and stuff like that. And for a group of students, this was a solution. You would teach them memorization skills, and now they were part of the first group. Yay, you know, happy, challenging content. But a part of the students, I would be saying, you know, we've got memorization skill. And <clears throat> he would come up to me and said, well, I had a test and my memory is so far below average that there's no point in me learning memorization technique because it won't work anyway. <laughs> like that was his conviction, that was his belief, that, is, that was his attitude towards life. And for me, this is one of the things that I thought was really interesting because I got stuck in school. Like this is why I did memorization technique because I was also tested and proven to have a bad memory. And then in a demonstration for the kids to show that you can actually train your memory and memorize 300 digits of pi in about 10 minutes. Not a very useful exercise, <laughs> admittedly, but it's a way to show like I've been proven that my memory isn't good, but with the right techniques and training, you can get to this level. So almost anybody can improve their memorization skills. But this kid didn't have a problem with the challenge level. He didn't have a problem with the skill. He had a problem with his life attitude. The way he looked at life was hindering him from living life. And in this case, it's about a fix or a growth mindset. If you have a fixed mindset, the world's divided in things I can do and things I cannot do. And if I cannot do them, there's no point in trying because I'll never be able to do them anyway. And quite a number of gifted kids fall into that category. They will stick within the field that they know because I can do that, but anything else is kind of scary and I'll stay away from that. <clears throat> and then there's also a group that is what they call twice exceptional. So they are both gifted, but they also have a challenge. So they're gifted and severely dyslectic. They're gifted and they might have HDD or ASD, like autism spectrum disorder, and that creates a whole set of challenges as well. But so if you look at the <clears throat> different support needs of different students, then they often go into these different categories. And what you see, at least what I see with a lot of programs of gifted children, but also parents working with gifted children, is that they'll move through these stages. The first time you learn about giftedness, you're like, wow, you know, my kid can take on a lot of more challenge, so I'm gonna give him all the content he needs. And after a while you figure out that sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, and then you start focusing a little bit more on the skills. And then if you do that more, you'll find out that usually you know, your beliefs and your life attitude are a limiting factor, and you start working on that. And that's one of the things I like working with in, <coughs> in this school, is you see a lot of focus on this third bit, uh, you know, leadership, integrity, you know, how are we, are we respectful of each other? Like, what is your life attitude? Because that's like the foundation that we're going to build all these other things upon. And then the content isn't there for the content. You know, advanced calculus might not be useful for you in your life if you're going to be an English major, but dealing with challenges and learning to think in a different way is going to be functional regardless, whatever you're going to do. So now it becomes a tool to learn something universal. <clears throat> so what I'm going to focus on today is a number of skills and life attitudes, because those go into those seven challenges. And what I found out is that um, you know, the way I describe my role is, um, I don't know, do you guys know like the medieval bard, uh, like the minstrel? 
Um, like that's pretty much me. I travel from school to school, and then I tell a, school, a story of another school and this school, and then they feed me. <laughs> like, that's, that's kind of my, my life story for the past 10 years. Like, uh, I don't come up with a lot of stuff myself, but I travel a lot, and I see a lot of places, and I tell stories, and then mix it. And in that, I've kind of become a taxonomy of possible solutions. And what, at, at some point, about 10 years ago, somebody asked, like, well, if you, want to, if you would need to summarize that in about like 45 minutes or an hour, like, what are the biggest problems you're going to run into if you're trying to guide the gifted kids, and what are the solutions to them, like practical things you can do? So that's where this story came from, and that's like the first book I've written as well, The Seven Challenges, so it's going to be translated into English as well at some point. Um, so the seven challenges are, first, the beliefs you have what you believe about intelligence, what you believe about learning will become true. If you believe I'm bad at math, then it will become true, not because it is true, but because the attitude you take towards learning math will prevent you from learning it. And then you will have a failing experience and it'll be like, see, it's true, and it'll become a downward spiral. As opposed to the other way, I can learn anything as long as I try. Well, if you keep trying, you will learn eventually. It might take more or less time, but with a better strategy, you'll get there anyway. The second one is memorization. I was just giving a, a small example that there is roughly, if we really generalize, two learning routes. You've got the comprehension learning route and the memorization learning route. So one is about understanding stuff and one is about just learning it by heart. And multiplication tables is a really classic example of this. Because somebody with a photographic memory will just look at the you know, multiplication table, you'll be like, put them in my head and I can look up all the answers. So, do -do -do -do. This is the answer. It's really ideal. If you've got a good memory, it's really fast, it's very reliable. The annoying thing is like if there is an answer on, or like a question you've never seen before, you don't know the answer. So even 11 times one, you won't know the answer just because it wasn't on your little chart. But what happens a lot with gifted kids is that they understand so much. And it's so easy for them to understand. So this gifted kid is looking at his multiplication table, he's like, whoa, that's gonna be a lot of work to memorize. But gladly, I understand. It's like kind of like complicated addition. So if I, you know, three times three is nine. And because, you know, most of the education system, you're going to spend about six months getting through the first five <laughs> multiplication tables, that works out pretty well. But then at some point, it can, it's going to get more complicated. And then they don't know what to do anymore. But luckily, again, the level is so low, you get about 30 seconds per multiplication sum. So you can still do it on your fingers. But so you never learn to memorize anything. And most of the things they learn basically happen by natural learning. They just watch Discovery Channel or stuff like that, so they pick it up. But they don't know how to do it consciously when it doesn't happen automatically. And the way I ask, I ask one of the students, like, what do you think learning is? He says, well, I'll look at the book, I'll fill it in, and the teacher will give me an A+. That's what learning is. Well, then you're in for a tough time by the time that the challenge level gets higher because it's not going to work for the rest of your time. You're not going to do like higher level physics string theory and look at it and fill it out and get an A+. Plus. Like that's not the way it's going to work. So you, you've got these two different learning routes, but if you overly depend on one of them, you're probably going to ne neglect the other one. So somebody who's brilliant at memorization is not going to put a lot of effort into comprehending stuff, which is going to be a barrier later on. But also somebody who's really good at comprehending stuff might not put any effort into road memorization, but that's going to limit you because you need a basic set of knowledge to operate from. So you need to train both of them. But because often we, we create these combined tests, which both call on memorization and comprehension, either route will give you like a passing grade. So you could do it purely on memorization and get a passing grade, or you can do it purely on comprehension and get a passing grade. So you're never confronted with that challenge, often until kids are like 10 or 11 or 12 years old. And then by that time, and I don't know if you've tried, ever tried to have an 11-year-old try a completely new strategy that he's never done before, but it's not an easy process, believe me. So motivation. Um, you hear a lot of talk about kids being demotivated, but what is that? It's such a big, amorphous blob of, you know, he's not moving, but why isn't he moving? So I'm going to call on some theories that divide up motivation in different levels of motivation and see what you can do with that. Having focused work for a prolonged period of time. Um, like this, I record many of my sessions, and um, one of them was called, he's got an IQ of 145, but he doesn't know how to clean up his room. Um, 
it's not rocket science. And that's like one of the most favorite videos on YouTube that I've ever posted because so many parents recognize it. Like, so how can, you, can it be that this, this conscious thinking part is so brilliant, but it can be so confused in organizing or staying focused for a prolonged period of time? So how does that work and how do you train that? Cooperation, often a, a big theme. They either won't do it or when they do it, they're like really bossy about it. Um, so <clears throat> I ask it, you know, what, you know what's, the, what's the value of cooperation? And he says, well, you know, for most of my school period, cooperation was that thing where I would get an A plus on my own and I would have to work together with two C's and together we would get a B because they would learn from it. Um, that's what cooperation is. And it's actually a pretty reliable description of what cooperation is in most of the education system, unfortunately. Um, and then they finally were put into like an acceleration group together, like a pull-out program, and they could work together. So we're all like, yay, now they're going to cooperate. Like within five minutes, it was a big fight. And like two of the kids came to me and said, you know, well, he doesn't know how to cooperate. And I'm like, well, what's happening? And he says, well, I told him what to do and he's not doing it. Because <laughs> that's what they think, you know, cooperation is. And why? If you always get an A plus and you work together with two Cs, the only way it's going to be a B if they do what they, you tell them to do. If you're going to do what they want to do, it's going to be a C. So there is profit to be gained there. Dealing with frustration and frustration tolerance. This is a big thing when the cheetah gets his first gazelle. It's going to be frustrating. It's not going to happen automatically. By the time you get to your level, and uh, probably a lot of you have gone through that when your kid you know, first got into this program, like getting up to speed is a big challenge. And dealing with things being frustrating like that's actually a skill you need to learn. And the skill begins with, you know, concentrating for about two or three minutes at a time because they never had to. Like regular school system is so simple for them. They do it in like two or three seconds. But imagine them, you know, doing a master's or a PhD program. There's going to be problems they're going to have to think about for two years. Can you imagine your kid sitting with a problem for two years? Like some of them will, but a lot of them haven't. So they need to learn to deal with frustration tolerance. You have to be tolerant for the fact that valuable, meaningful problems will be frustrating. If they're not frustrating, they're not hard enough. But that's like a lesson you need to learn. And what I call the concept stack or knowledge gaps. Um, because they go so fast and they want to go so fast, often they'll skip kind of foundational steps. Um, I'm lucky enough to be in South Lake Tahoe right now with my family, my seven and eight year old. So they've spent the past week learning how to ski. And my youngest one is definitely one of those, like I'm gonna go as fast as I can. And she's like, I can go down the mountain. Why learn to make turns? Like that's annoying, it's slowing me down. <laughs> but I was talking with her about like, how do you think you're ever gonna go down the black diamonds? Like that's where you need it. But because we're creating this safe environment where she's only on the green slope, she thinks she doesn't need fundamentals. And that's like a challenge as educators. Because on one end, we need to simplify the world so it's kind of manageable for kids. But with gifted kids, if you do that too much, they will take, they, they will take short corners. They, they, they will skip steps because they figure, like, I don't need them. Like the kid doing the multiplication table on his fingers. It's a valid strategy because he's getting high grades. Like, nothing is giving him feedback that this is not a good strategy. So that's a challenge, and that's where they often get knowledge gaps. Like, a, another one is in language. Because then natural language processing is so strong, they don't know any grammar rules because they don't need them. They're infallible in their, in their writing and their speech. But then when you get to like more advanced or foreign languages, then you need to know what the rules came from to be able to translate them. But if you didn't know there were rules in the first place, that's going to be a challenge. So there's sometimes knowledge gaps because of the, the way they go through materials. So what I'm going to do now is go through each of these seven challenges and give a couple of practical tips on like how to deal with that. What can you do as a parent and, and what often does a school do to support your kids in dealing with these challenges. <clears throat> so the first thing is beliefs. And we were already talking about that they were kind of like self-fulfilling prophecies. I don't know, do you guys know the mindset theory by Carol Dweck? Who's heard of it? By, raise your hand. Yeah, most of you. 
Um, so this is one of the different theories out of a bigger field of uh, positive psychology or applied positive psychology, where they look at different traits like uh, your mindset, but also hopefulness is one of them, uh, resilience is another of them, um, learned optimism versus learned pessimism. And so these are all different ways of looking at the world and mostly ways of how do you go about dealing with obstacles and challenges. And it's your attitude towards a challenge that's going to make a big difference in your ability to deal with them. Um, so um, to make it more concrete, like mindset, a growth mindset is aimed at I want to learn new things. I can learn whatever I want to learn as long as I put effort in, as opposed to a fixed mindset saying, you know, I either can or cannot do something. By the way, a lot of gifted kids get into that precisely because they were so successful. Because learning for a long time was, I look at it, I fill it out, I get an A+. Then you start dividing in the world into things that you can do that with and things you cannot do that with. And you know, a, a kid actually literally said to me, you know, I spent a whole two minutes studying this and I still couldn't do it. So probably, like that's 10 times longer than I've ever spent on anything. Like, so it's probably impossible for me. But that's just because he's never run into something like that. And that's also why it's so good to do stuff like sports or musical instruments. Like there's no talenting your way out of it. Like you do need to have practice and skill. And that's where you get, for instance, Malcolm Gladwell research, research the 10,000 hours rule. So to get to mastery, you need 10,000 hours of deliberate practice, regardless of the amount of talent you have. And of course you need talent to get to a world level, but just talent's not gonna get you there. And so two things that I often do with kids is the first, primarily, primarily focus your feedback on effort. So effort is more important than either your talent or the end result. Um, your talent, you're not gonna do anything about. I could tell you all day that you've got an IQ of 149, but that's not gonna change. It's not gonna get higher, it's not gonna get lower. At, at most it's gonna give you the sense of entitlement. My IQ of 145 should get me my diploma. You know, why should I still work for it? I already have the IQ. No, the IQ is only the potential. So the question is how much of your potential are you gonna translate into reality? And that's going to be determined by your effort. If you're going to work hard, you're going to have a lot of your IQ turned into practicality. If you're not going to do anything, you're probably still going to get quite far because your IQ is going to be a good boost on that, but you're not going to get nearly as far as you could go. And by focusing on effort, and that's kind of hard because it's subjective, because we like objectifying, you know, it, it's, an, it's right or wrong, but giving feedback in a sense of, wow, you know, you got an A plus on a test, but I think you kind of slacked it out. I didn't really see it try hard. And we gave you two new strategies to try out. You didn't do anything with it. You didn't persevere when it got hard. So I think there's value to be gotten there. And the school I set up at some of the schools I worked with, we actually started grading double. So you get a grade for your end result. It's like an A plus, but it might be a C in effort because you didn't put any effort in. Or it might be a C in end result, but an A plus in effort. You took on something like almost impossibly hard, and you didn't, you didn't get a great result, but we really appreciate how hard you worked. And after a while, if you focus your feedback on that, kids are actually more interested in your feedback on effort than on the result. Because they're like, well, I get A pluses, I know. I, I get a lot of them. But wow, you know, Mrs. Smith told me I got like an A plus, and like nobody gets A pluses with Mrs. Smith in effort. Like I really tried my best. And then there's like real learning going on. And the other thing is reflect on superstars. Reflect on, like, I don't know, well, we have a lot of soccer, of course, so we've got Lionel Messi, but you get, can have Kobe Bryant or something, or some soccer star or like a musical instrument god to your child, and then start doing research, do a project on them. Start making an estimate on how many hours they practice a week and how many hours they've practiced in their life to get to where they are now. Do you think, you know, Michael Jordan woke up one morning and said, you know, hey, you know, I'll be a, you know, basketball superstar. No, it's cost, cost him like thousands and thousands and thousands of hours. And even when he was the God, he was still practicing like dozens or even 20, 30, 40 hours a week. So why are you expecting that your talent's going to get you there? You really need to combine your talent with effort. So give feedback on effort and do reflection on superstars because that makes it real for them. The second is memorization. Well, I talk, already talked about it. memorization or comprehension route. And if you overly depend on one of those routes, you're probably going to suffer in the long term. And unfortunately, it's part of the system later on. 
I'm not sure, like, if we talk about the future, how long memorization is going to be valuable. Like, if we talk about 15, 20 years in the future, we're actually talking about brain-computer interfaces, you kind, of, you kind of Google in your own brain. But still, for now on, like, if you want to get your SATs, if you want to get placement in all kinds of universities, you're going to be able to use your memory, because if you don't, you're going to get stuck. But what I see in most countries and, and in the US in a number of schools as well, is that we lessen the focus on it early in school, because actually with a five to 10 year old, we don't really believe in it as much. So we start focusing more on skills and stuff like that, which is good. But in the end, when they're 16, they're gonna get a final exam that is gonna depend on it. So I'm really making it a later point that we're gonna confront them with it. And it's actually a lot harder to teach a 12 year old a completely new skill he's never used than to teach a six year old one. So the earlier you can begin with using memorization, and especially in high school, um, a lot of teachers that I work with start uh, grading in two ways as well, saying this is your grade for comprehension, this is your grade for memorization. And that might be like an A plus for comprehension. Awesome, you really understood your stuff, but you get a D for memorization. You don't know your basic facts. So can you combine those? And so the first thing you can do as a parent is assign value to it because most parents of gifted kids I know are gifted as well, and they hate memorization as well. Mm -hmm. So the first tendency is to say to your kid, I hated it as well. For camera, this were really stupid. Yeah. Just ignore it and focus on comprehension, then it'll be fun. But that's actually setting up for failure because they're gonna need it. And if you're gonna be the one giving feedback, like it was hard, but I tried and I persevered, focus on effort again, then probably they're gonna be more willing to do it as well. <laughs> How to train it? Start always by testing it objectively. Telling a kid your memory isn't that good is not gonna be very effective with a gifted kid because that's gonna set you up for like a big struggle. But do a test. You know, here's 20, 20 per carrier words memorized. Let's see if we can do that in like two minutes or the multiplication table or whatever you're working on. Most important, have a time limit because given enough time, you're gonna use comprehension, but given short time, it has to be automated and then more often than not, you'll see kids failing that test, and then they're like, well, oh, there's something I cannot do. Hmm, there might be something I need to do something about. So offer methods. Uh, methods. Uh, one of the concrete things you can look online for is mnemonics. Awful, awful word. Um, but yeah, the, a lot of the memory techniques are based around mnemonics. <laughs> I'm not going to say that again. <laughs> um, but yeah, so offer the methods, try different things and reflect yourself. Like, this is what I do. I tell a story in my head or I make a picture of it. So that's offering them different ways of doing and test again. See if it got better. And that way you can train memory. What I found in most students is that you, never, you can never stop training it. I tried a million different programs. There's nothing you can do for three to six months that's going to give long-term memory ability. It needs to come back every two months or every month. Because if you stop focusing on it, a year later you see memory skills go down and you see problems occur. So it needs to be an ongoing thing to train memory. And when you see grades failing, first thing to check is, is memorization still kind of replaced? Are you doing it? Are you putting in the hours as well? <laughs> Third one, motivation. And motivation is such a tricky word because it's such a big word. It, it means so many different things. So um, I was really happy when I ran to Martin Seligman with Positive Psychology because he actually made a study of what is motivation and the next thing was what types of motivation are there. And I'm going to go through the three types of motivation and actually later on he expanded it to five. This is kind of like the popular psychology version, like they've got more technical terms, but this is a more fun way to tell it. Um, so it starts out with rockstar happiness. Rockstar happiness is the, the lowest form of happiness. And rockstar happiness is when you get what you want. I want more money, I get more money, I'm happy. You know, I want a bigger car, I get a bigger car, I'm happy. So when I get what I want, I'll be happy. There's two challenges with that. Um, the first one is it lasts relatively shortly. They've proven this time and time again with lottery winners. Uh, somebody who wins a lottery, regardless of the amount of money they win, within eight months they're back to the same baseline happiness that they had before, regardless of what they did with the money or how much it was. I see many of you thinking, give me the money, I'll show you a higher return. <laughs> but this is pretty universal, eight months. And the second problem is that you get um, happiness deflation, or happiness inflation actually, technically. You need more and more of the input to get the same amount of happiness. 
If you doubt that, think about your first paycheck and the amount of hours you had to work for that. And if you would work the same amount of hours and you got the same paycheck, if you would be equally happy as the first time you got it. <laughs> and for almost everybody, it'll be a lot lower. It needs to go higher and higher and higher to get the same amount of happiness. So this is a bit of a challenge. And the biggest challenge is that actually most of our Western societies build around rockstar happiness. Because it's all built around this idea, there will be one day where you will truly have everything you want and then you will be permanently happy. And actually that day that you have everything that you've ever wanted, that, that's going to come. It's called the beginning of your midlife crisis. <laughs> because then you figure out I've got everything I ever wanted but I'm still not happy. Why isn't it working out? Um, so that's kind of like two paths. It's kind of like, like of course, you've got the, the, the wrong male version of it. You get a red car and, and a new girlfriend. But then eight months later, you're kind of like in the same position. So it's better to go for a higher level of motivation. You're going to go for passion, flow, and engagement. Passion, flow, and engagement is that moment that you forget about time. You forget about food. You forget about everything because you're so engaged in the thing that you're doing. And it meet, needs to meet two requirements. It needs to be a field that you're interested in and it needs to be at an appropriate challenge level. If it meets those two things, you will get a happiness buzz. And a deeper one that, than you get in Rockstar Happiness. You can get it any moment in life. You can get it if you've never had it in your 70 year going to university, you're finally you know, finding your field and finding your flow, it'll give you happiness. There's no inflation because every time you do it, it will give you that same amount of happiness. So that's a really good place to be. And one that's even higher is higher purpose of meaning. Knowing why and having that deep sense of purpose. I mean, if I speak for educators, most don't feel a lot of rockstar happiness when they look at their paycheck. Mm -hmm. uh, passion, flow, and engagement isn't the first thing that comes up when you think about all your registration and administration chores. But the meaning, making a difference in somebody else's life, like that gets you through the entire summer or maybe even an entire year that you had like these two or three students that were kind of like at the cusp of like, is he gonna make it or not? And then found their way in life. Like that's gonna keep you going for a long time. But then if we put this on most of the kids in the education system, often like the amount of meaning, like um, <clears throat> I was asking this kid, he was really cynical, but like what's the, the goal of the education system? Like what's the end result? He said, I've calculated the answer to that question. Like calculated the answer? Yeah, he said, it's eight big containers full of paper because he calculated every week how many sheets of paper he, he was using and like extrapolating it over like an 18 year education period and he says like the, the exchange rate is really bad because i hand in like these eight containers and i get like two sheets of paper back like my <laughs> diploma it's like something's going wrong now but it does show that a lot of kids are missing the meaning of the education system because they don't relate to the goals and when they do relate to the goals i mean i was just here for um, a bunch of kids doing the Olympiad, and like they're really engaged. They know why they're doing it. They, they know what the meaning behind it is. Passion, flow, and engagement. Probably you've seen a large difference between your kid before they came here and when they came here. Because here, you no know, challenge level is appropriate. They put a lot of time in differentiating to your kid's needs so that they're challenged appropriately. So they find flow. Probably not automatically because of the frustration tolerance we're going to talk about. But once they found flow, like that's a lot deeper. But before that, often it's almost non-existent because the level was too low for them. And then what will happen? No meaning, no passion, flow, and engagement. They'll go back to rocks for happiness. And then you see yourself turning into that stick and carrot parent. Only when I reward or when I punish will I get my kid to move anywhere. But if I don't do that, nothing is happening. And why is that? Because the higher levels of motivation weren't available. It's just not reasonably available for your kid. So he dropped down to the lowest level. And then he started getting really efficient, like the cheetah. Like the minimum amount of work to get the maximum result. So what do you do with that? Like rockstar happiness, the only way to get somebody going is rock, uh, carrot and stick. Flow, differentiate, differentiate in speed and content. Make sure that your kid has an appropriate challenge level and gets at least some of his time. That doesn't have to be 100% of the time, doesn't even have to be 50% of the time, but a decent amount of time in the subject area that he's engaged in. To go for, towards meaning is values in action. What do you think is important? Do stuff towards that. I think it's bad that people are poor, do something about it. I think that, that it's bad that people are hungry, do something about it. I think people should be happier, do something about it. And when you do something about something you care about, 
it will make you happy in a much deeper way than any of the others. What I will often say is that um, rockstar happiness often is kind of like the kickstart engine for flow, uh, for the diesel of flow. Because flow will keep you going for a long time, but it's hard to expect a kid who's completely demotivated and sitting on the sofa to poof, go into flow. So often you have to use the carrot and a stick for a little while to get them going um, until they discover like, the, the joys of being in flow. Um, the deeper the motivation you're trying to reach, the more complex it is for the environment to manage it. It's easier to design a rock star happiness environment. Just institute more payments uh, or more punishments, more rewards. That's actually the easiest from the perspective of you know, an educator or a parent. That's why I see, unfortunately, a part of the public education system going in that direction, designing more elaborate punishments, designing more elaborate rewards. Because it's often they find it too complicated to go towards flow. Um, I was just talking to Scooby, like the, the, the headache that is the beginning of the year of getting every kid to the appropriate challenge level and getting them all placed in the right subject. Like that's a lot of work for a school to do. But by doing that, by investing that extra time, they really set the kids up to reach a lot more flow in the rest of the year, which saves them a lot of effort afterwards. But that takes like foresight and, and like an investment in the education process. Focused work, and this is about the executive functions. You have different parts of your brain. You've got the conscious thinking part of the brain, and that's actually really well developed in a lot of gifted kids. But the automation bit often is a lot less so. One of the ways you can test that in a fun way is give two assignments at the same time. So those multiplication tables, can you also do them when it's throwing a ball back and forth? Well, then you see either the ball dropping or the ball dropping on the multiplication tables because they didn't automate it. They didn't make it part of an ingrained habit. And you see that in a lot of areas. And it's kind of like an extension of the memory we're talking about. Just use it or lose it. If you don't need to have focused attention, I was asking one of the students, like, why can't you listen for more than five minutes? He says, because I never do. Because the teacher will tell me three times in a lesson, and after she's told me three times, I'm going to get a sheet of paper that says it, and I can read it faster. So why listen the three times? So actually, you have to make, you have to train this ability to be focused for a while. That's probably going to be, has been part of the on-ramp of getting here, getting used to like, oh, wow, this is going faster. I need to actually focus to, to keep up. And that actually takes training. So if it's not required, it's not going to be practiced. And a couple of things you can do to train that, um, again, uh, assign value to it. And like a general advice I can give you on anything is what they call psychoeducation. The cool thing about these kids is they understand everything. So explain, just like I did, or show them a presentation or a video afterwards and say, you know, like, what, do you recognize this? Do you have this as well? Because then they'll start working with you to try to solve it. Um, assign value to it, as opposed to like the, the Speaking for myself as a, as a parent, like it's a lot easier to do it for them. <laughs> like if it's like a six step process, then it's easier for me to do it than for them to do it. But if I keep doing it for them, they'll never learn how to do it. And especially if they've got weak executive functions, like if their room is a mess all the time and if you ask them to do two things, they're like already lost before they left the room, like they will need to train that ability because that's going to hinder them in the long term. So it's really important to do that. Um, so what's important is to start from small steps to larger steps. Like if you've got a kid that cannot concentrate for more than two minutes, there's no point in putting them in a room and giving them a lecture for 30 minutes because that jump is too big. You can't go from two minutes to 30 minutes. You can go from two to four and four to 10 and 10 to 20 and build it up. Actually, in our classrooms, we, we play the game. We, we try a lot of games. Actually, this one was by far the most popular. I, I didn't even dare recommend it because it's, it's actually kind of brutal. It's the, the game is called Look at the Stopwatch. <laughs> and you've got two kids looking at a stopwatch, and a third one is a juror, and the one who, gets, who, who, is, who can look at the stopwatch the longest wins. <laughs> like, that's, that's actually the game. <laughs> we did all these really complicated things. You've got like CogMed and all these really fancy stuff. This works best by far. Um, and, they, and we train it up until everybody could do it for at least five minutes. Like it's even kind of like a mindfulness training um, device as well. But it really helped them in the ability to focus for a prolonged period of time, which translated to almost everything. They would, would be, it would be easier to pay attention to a teacher. It would be easier to focus on their work for a longer period of time because they need that foundational block to be able to do that. 
if your kid has trouble doing a lot of things in a row, um, like, you know, maybe you're one of those parents who found your kid more than once running through the house kind of like naked and wet saying, where are the towels? Mm -hmm. Because they didn't think like to get a towel before you get into the shower as opposed to afterwards. Like that's a step-by-step -step process, you know, get your clothes, get your towel, then take your clothes off, then get in the shower, you know. But then you can train it, make a list, actually just write it out, uh, put a clothespin next to it to the step where they are, and then they can move through it. Especially with younger kids, it's, it's good to train it up. All the kids often can use this as well. If you've got that, one of those kids who's got a lot of trouble with what they call task initiation, so between the moment of I decide I'm going to do math and the moment they're actually working on it, if that's like more than 10 minutes, as in taking three books, a couple of pens and sitting down, um, then they're going to have a lot of value in this. Like have a list, put a clothespin next to it, and then you're going to train it up in the sense that, like for instance, you've got seven steps, and after a while you're going to just cross out one of the steps. So it's going to step one, this, step two, three, step four, blank, step five. But they've gone through the list so often, they know what step four is. But then you're going to blank out each one of them. And after a while, it's just a list with one through seven, which are all blank. And then it's, you know, you don't need the list anymore. But then you're training it step by step. One of the good books about it, it's actually a little bit small, but are the books by Dawson and Guare. Uh, Peck Dawson and Richard Guare have written a series of books about uh, smart but scattered about smart kids who have weak executive functions. And they differentiate between 11 functions, how to test them, and how to support them. So yeah. I'll send it afterwards as well. Um, Let's see if this works. So cooperation, it's all about why bother? Like if cooperation is not functional, you're not going to do it. I wouldn't cooperate with a copy of myself, and especially if not, if that copy of myself is going to be less intelligent than I am but you've got the same skills and same knowledge. Like that, there's no point in that. So um, one of the ways to do that is say, well, we, we can divide the room up in four parts and we're gonna talk about the International Space Station and you guys are gonna research how to get there. You guys are gonna re research how life is there, the politics and how it's built. And we're gonna do that for two weeks and now we're gonna create the final groups. Out of each group, we're gonna take one expert and the four of them together are gonna do a paper on the International Space Station. So now you need the other three, because even if you've got an IQ of 200, you're still gonna need the knowledge in their heads to be able to finish your work. And that's the way I work together as well. I mean, I'm, I'm gonna get a lawyer. I, I didn't do like four years of law, so I lack that knowledge. Even if he's got like 30 IQ points less than I do, he's still valuable because he's got knowledge that I don't have. So now, if you design cooperation um, in a valuable way, the kids will see the value and start working on it. Like, I need to be mindful on how to get that knowledge out of your head. Um, so make it functional, assign value to it. Again, if you're going to say, I hate cooperation as well, you know, those idiots at my work, you know, I hate working <laughs> with them as well. Like, they're not going to be very motivated. While well, if you say, like, well, I had challenges with it as well, but this is what I learned. And actually, um, as a parent, teach them hacks. Um, a lot of you will have learned ways of dealing with your colleagues. Like that's actually valuable skills for your kid to have. Like what I often do is this, this and that, and then actually stuff will go easier if I want to, you know, compliment, I'm, I'm going to compliment somebody before I'm going to criticize them or something, or I'm going to bring, bring them a Starbucks because they're going to be a little bit happier and I'm going to criticize them and I'm going to make a compliment, but it works better that way, trust me. <laughs> so now they're learning how to do it, but in a functional way. And again, feedback on effort. Are you trying to get better at it? And practice the skill. Uh, Practice skill of empathy, of listening, of uh, making decisions. Like those are different skills that you can train. Again, often in our schools we give separate assignments. So you've got two assignments. The content of your assignment is the International Space Station. The skill we're practicing this, this day is empathy. So at the end we're going to do a round and ask, did everybody feel heard? Like that's the goal skill that we're trying to train. Doesn't matter what comes out of it, but did you have empathy? Frustration tolerance, again, that idea of the ideal challenge. This is kind of like a myth that if you give a, a gifted kid the ideal challenge, everything will be effortless, happy, and you know, peace will come to the lands. Um, it just doesn't work that way, because if it's really a good challenge, it's going to frustrate them. And one of the myths of challenge is like, um, that I'm going to work to give you the perfect challenge. Well, when I looked in school system and we tried to do that, 
we would a group of students would inevitably get, get the feedback when we ask, you know, is this the right challenge for you? They would say like, no, this is too hard for me. No, it's too easy. And you would scale them up. No, it's too hard. And you scale them down. It's too easy, too hard, too easy. But they would never say too easy or too hard, but they would use like the magic blanket word that every gifted kid in the world knows. And that it's boring, <laughs> boring. Because if I'm going to say it's too easy or too hard, there might be something wrong with me. But if I'm going to say boring, I can say the material is broken. You gave me dysfunctional material. So fix the material and I will be happy. And if you're an educator who lets himself tricked into that dance, you're going to spend all day doing it. Because it's never perfect. The material can always be better. But there's also a num uh, quite a bit of responsibility for a student to make the material work. Because if your frustration tolerance is like really narrow, immediately goes like too hard, too, too easy, too hard, too easy. Well, if your frustration tolerance is really wise, then it can be harder, you don't care. It can be easier, you don't care, because you're just going to put in effort and make it work. So it's really important to train that concept of frustration. And it's really about valuing that and showing it yourself. Our challenge as adults is that we too often present ourselves to our kids as being done. We're perfect. <laughs> You know, we've got it all together and we don't, when we don't have it together, we'll go talk to our you know, spouse or therapist and then we go back to our kids and we're perfect again. And you know, teachers, they know everything. But that paints a picture to students that that is the goal. The goal is to be finished. While most adults, when they are truthful, they know they're never finished and there's always more to learn and that they still fail. So I really make a point also with my kids. You know, I had skiing lessons. I, I, sno I, I snowboarded for about 14 years, and now I'm taking skiing lessons. Really frustrating because I know how to go like a double black diamond on my snowboard, but now I'm like fumbling around the green slope. But I make a point of talking to my kids about how frustrating it is and that I persevere because that, that's the way that I'm going to get to the happy place again of being able to go down all the mountains. So it's really important to value that. Train frustration. And um, with kids, especially in the beginning, I'll often say, my job is to frustrate you. And I'm going to frustrate you every single week. <laughs> Aren't you happy that I am your guidance counselor? Um, and ideally, you want to do that by perfectly designed curriculum. Um, but that's not always going to work, obviously. Um, the simpler way is to just go out to the store and buy Sudokus. Do one star, two star, three star, four star. Whichever one takes more than 10 minutes to solve is the right one. <laughs> And then they need to train their frustration tolerance. Like, can you sit with it? And of course, like they're all going to ask you two half ones is not the same as one whole one. Because <laughs> they're going to do like all of them, the easy half, and then they're going to stop. But this is about training frustration tolerance, dealing with the fact that any appropriate challenge is going to be challenging and is going to be frustrating for a while. Um, and support school when this moment comes. It's going to come. If it doesn't come, if your kid hasn't come home and said, well, you know, it's a pretty cool school as Davidson, it's a lot better than my old school, but it's still, you know, it's boring. And it's that, that, that initial drive that might come up in you for all those years that you had to fight the public school or the other school and saying like, ah, oh, do something with my kid, but resist the urge of going to school and saying like, oh, you're not, you know, challenging my kid enough. Go back to your kids. Have you gone to your teacher? Have you talked to them? Have you, you know, had a discussion? Because either it's going to be correct, but then you need to inform your teacher and you need to qualify for a higher level. Or there might be another reason why you're not having challenge with this specific challenge. So this is really important to, to stay supportive of your kid to solve their own problems. Because it's going to help them a lot in the long term. Like in university, nobody's going to care if you're going to send them an email saying like, I'm not sure you're a challenge level appropriate at MIT, you know? <laughs> like, don't think that they're going to care too much. Um, and so the last uh, challenge is a concept stack. And what you see is that a lot of kids learn by feel as opposed to knowing the rules. And sometimes they really need to go a couple of steps back. And it might actually be literally a couple of stack, steps back. That in, in the previous school, they were already up to calculus two. And here they're saying you have to go back to calculus one. And that might be because they missed some foundation. And if you're going to say like, oh, that's awful because you, did, you, know, you already did calculus two, then your kid's not going to be willing to do it. But if you're going to present it in a way, you're going to say, well, no, but um, probably there's going to be some foundation you're missing. And, and, and undoubtedly, they're going to challenge you enough. So, so let's see what you can learn there. That's going to make a whole world of difference. 
And often you see like those gaps and it's going to hold them back for a little bit, but then like the, the real acceleration is going to start. But as long as they have those gaps, you know, as long as I let my seven-year-old, you know, just go down the, her pizza pie stands <laughs> on her ski, it seems cool for a little while, but then she'll get stuck. And if I'm going to allow her to do this, she's going to stop skiing because the greens are going to be too boring, the blacks are going to be too hard, and then she says I'm going to stop because it's stupid. As opposed to getting through that step of learning the fundamentals, learning how to make the turns when she needs to, and then she can enjoy all the more complicated steps as well. It's a little bit slower in the beginning, but in the long term it's really going to serve her. So rejoice in, in solving gaps and always ask back. Like if something's not working out, if you're getting a failing grade or something is really hard, do you know what comes before this? Like, do, are, are you really, like, you're having trouble with Calculus 2? Do you know all the Calculus 1 things? Are you having trouble with Spanish? Do you even know what, like, an infinitive is? Or do you know what a verb is? Like, some kids don't, have never heard of a verb, just because they never needed that to get a passing grade. So these were the seven challenges I wanted to run you through. Um, I've already run out of time, still have some things to say, but I don't want to be disrespectful and run through a time. So I'm just quickly going to um, give you some things. Um, how to support twice exceptional children. Um, I see a lot of misdiagnosis going on on one hand. On the other hand, I also see some challenges. So one of the things that I look at is like, where is the challenge coming from? What's the support need? A kid might behave like an HDD kid, but that doesn't mean he has or he is HDD. Because is it in his brain physiology? Sometimes it's actually a food allergy, or sometimes it's just missing the skill of organizing himself. So it's really important to see where does the challenge come from. And especially at Phoenix and different places, we're really looking at all these different levels at testing a kid, like where are your challenges coming from? So if you have a 2 e kid, it's really important to look at that. And also in asynchronous development, often now we only look at verbal uh, development and performal development, like that's the old Weckler scale, but there may be even 10 or 11 different scales from emotional development, moral development, ego development, uh, cognitive development. And so we at our school really chart all these different levels to see like where are your challenges coming from. Um, the book I'm writing is A Bright Future for Our Bright Minds. I really be believe that the future is really changing rapidly and the school system should adapt to that. So you know, what should education be about? You see a lot of education being about remembering and matching and batch processing, all the things that computers are really, really good at, and the things that human beings are good at. We tend to scrap them from the curriculum because they're too complicated or we don't know how to, how to organize it. So the model I was just giving you, like if the future is known, then you should teach a kid knowledge. Like if you're a farmer 100 years ago, you just need to know when to plant your seeds. And if you do that well, you'll be fine. But in an unknown world, if you're going to be a lawyer, I can't tell you what the right answer is. I can teach you the skills to get to the right answer. But for our unknowable future, you know, if we're going to go to Mars or if like half the jobs are going to disappear, disappear then our life attitude and self-awareness are going to make the difference. So I think that those parts should be more and more the focus of the education system. That's what the book is going to be about, proving that it's necessary and how to, uh, how to do that. Because this is a quote I really like, in times of change, the learners will inherit the earth, while the learneth will find themselves beautifully equipped for a world that no longer exists. And I think if that was true at any point in time, then it's definitely now. And that's what we do at School of Understanding. We try to apply as many of these principles as possible, like in, in real life, and we're building software systems to, um, to support that, to measure well-being, to measure flow, to measure meaning, to measure your degree of showing respect, and to give feedback on that. And I was just you know, kind of joking with Scooby, like you can't say you've got a D for integrity. Like that's <laughs> like, not how it works. You have to give feedback points and support people in that. So to facilitate that process, we're, we're developing software to do that. So I tried to give you some knowledge. I hope it was valuable enough to uh, spend one of these evenings on. Um, if you want to ask questions, you can do, but they do need to clear out. And I do want to make sure that, that everybody who works here gets a gets good night. Um, I will be in the region for a little bit. Um, I'm going to be in uh, San Francisco on the 21st of February. I'm going to do a presentation on a bright future for our bright minds. Um, so you might want to come to that. And I'm going to be at the California Association of the Gifted on Sunday. I'm going to give a presentation there as well. So if you happen to be in that area, I'll send this through as well. Then um, we might see each other again back there. Um, 
if you want to help me, then please spread the word. I'm just starting doing all this stuff in English. Um, I gathered a lot of knowledge. I hope you can kind of see that in his presentation. I'm trying to find places to share that. So if you've got some place I can give a presentation or somebody who would be interested in these videos, please uh, spread them along. And let me know your questions now or later, and I can uh, answer them online or somewhere. So thank you so much for your attention, and I hope you have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome.